Hello, today is September 21st, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. And today we are privileged to have with us Milton D. Cohen. Welcome, Milton. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Somerville, Massachusetts, September 14, 1925. So you just had a birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. And where are you currently living? I'm living in Framingham, Mass. And did you grow up in Somerville? Uh, no, I was in, mostly in uh, neighborhoods of Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester. And did you graduate from school in Boston? Yes, I did from Roxbury Memorial High School, 1942. In fact, I had an interesting discussion with a friend of mine whom I visited yesterday at the Rehu, Re, Hebrew Rehab. He's there, unfortunately he's not too well, and he always thought that he was the youngest person to graduate from Rock Memorial. His birthday was the end of June, and we graduated early June in 1942. So I explained to him, Nate, discovered that I'm the youngest who graduated from Rock Memorial. My birthday was in September 14th, 1942. I turned 17. So you were the youngest in so your class? So I was still 16, right, at wow. that time. And what is your current marital status? I'm married. And do you have children? Yes, I have two children, a boy and a girl. And grandchildren? Yes, two grandchildren. Again, again a boy and a girl. After you graduated from Roxbury Memorial, did you go to work or to, on to school? I did both. I couldn't afford to go to college during the day, so I, went, I worked during the day and I went to Boston University evenings. And did you know what you were going to, what courses you were going to take? Uh, I took basically business courses because I thought I would end up doing something business-wise and a foreign language. And what did, what was your work during the day? What did you do? I just worked for a, uh, a manufacturing company who made uh, letterheads, envelopes. Stationer type of place? Stationery. Right. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered the military in 1943 out of Boston, and I was sent first to Camp Devons in Ayer, Massachusetts. Why did you join at that time? Because I was drafted. My birth, I turned 18 September 14th and I received a notice from Uncle Sam that I was now in the Army. And so you didn't have a choice about joining no. the Army? No. Did you have other friends? No. At that time, no. Nobody would join with me. And did you do your basic training at Camp Devons? No. From there I was sent to Camp Croft in South Carolina for infantry basic training. You were pretty young. Yes, I feel that 18 is really much too young to be in service, especially back in 40, was it 43, because we were not brought up with computers, with television, as the youngsters have today. But even that is still young, even today. Uh, about a month ago, before my grandson started college this year in Boston, he and I went out for dinner one night. I'm looking at him and I'm saying, Josh, you just turned 18 two months ago, and at your age, I was already in the Army. It was too young, and I could never picture him at the same age being in service. So young. As that article said I gave you in the, in the newspaper, the entertainer asked me how old I was. I told him I was 18, and in the paper he said he looked more like 15. And you were going off to war. And I'm going off to war. Were you afraid? Uh, not really afraid. You sort of look forward to it. When you, when you did become afraid, was when you were ready to go into battle. But once you were there, you just had to do what had to be done. 
And what do you remember about Camp Croft? And where was that, I'm sorry? Camp Croft was in, outside of Spartansburg, South Carolina. South Carolina, thank you. What did you like or dislike, or what do you remember about basic training? Well, that's funny. the first day at basic training, I learned the hard way, never volunteer. We were all in the barracks, and we were given the task of cleaning up, making the beds, and so forth. The staff sergeant, I remember his name too, Sergeant Mueller, came out and asked, anybody play chess? I do. So I didn't have to work then. We went into his room in the front of the place, and not being as wise at the time, I beat him in the game of chess. And after that, the whole week, I had latrine duty. I had to clean around the toilets and the floor. It was, it was a mess. That was my first Punishment. lesson. Don't volunteer. But you were a good chess player. Right. <laughs> and were you in basic training for how many weeks? Do you remember? Let's see. I got there in November. There in November, December, January, February, March, and part of April. And then we were sent back to, I was sent back to Fort Devens. And were you back, were you doing any kind of advanced or specialized training after basic? No, at that time I had no specialized training, strictly infantry, riflemen, and everything that goes with it. How did you do with, uh, on the rifle range? On the rifle range? We, uh, as time went on, we, we all improved. And how long were you at Devons? At Devons for a short while, because from Fort Devons, see, this was in April, sometime for the middle end of April, and then from Fort Devons, strangely enough, we were shipped out of the port of Boston, heading towards England. And did you know at the time that you were going over to England and why? No, I had no idea where we were going. And there's a very interesting story with this train ride from Fort Devens to the Port of Boston. When I was in kindergarten, at the age of four, it was the Benedict Fenwick School, and right behind the school was a railroad track. And every time a train would go by, I would jump up, run to the window, couldn't help myself. I was warned by the teacher, if I did it again, I'd have to hold up my hand and get hit with a stick. Train went by and I couldn't control it. I went to the window, watched it, and I got hit with the stick. The train went right by the back of that school on my way to the uh, to Boston. So that had to bring back some right. nostalgia to you, mm -hmm. right? Did you see anyone peek out the window? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. <laughs> they were smarter, huh? <laughs> yeah. So here you are, an infantryman. You're going over on a ship. Right. Prior to leaving, because you were pretty close to home, were you able to see your family before you went overseas? Yes, yes, I was able to. Was that difficult for you, leaving your family? No, no. Mm -hmm. And what was it like going over on the ship? Do you remember, or what kind of ship it I was? I remember the ship. We were in a large convoy, and it took probably about 10 days to cross because they were zigzagging all the way across to avoid the uh, Nazi submarines. Did you see any? No, didn't see any. We got across safely, but it was a long and for a while a sickening type of journey. Did you get seasick? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once you re were you hearing, what were you hearing about the war prior to being shipped out? What was I what? What were you hearing about the war? Fearing about it? Hearing. Hearing. Like, hearing oh, about hearing it. about the war. Well, of course, we saw a lot of. Uh, I guess you'd call it propaganda film during basic training, and it showed us the atrocities that the uh, Germans were committing in Russia and in Europe, and uh, we felt that it was a it was a just war for us to be into. And did you feel patriotic about going over, or in a sense, I felt. Well, maybe not then, but afterwards I felt more mm -hmm. patriotic than I did at the time. Mm -hmm. And once you reached England, what were your first thoughts or experiences when you well, got off the ship? Well, first of all, we reached England, it was about the 24th of May, and it, this was in 19, 
44. And at the time, we didn't realize that D-Day, that's the Allied invasion of uh, Nazi-controlled France, was to take place. And what probably saved me from hitting the beaches on D-Day was the fact that, for some reason, I don't know why, they selected me and sent me to radio school in Liverpool, England. Now, at the time, you didn't know it was going to be the invasion, correct? Had I you, didn't know what? You, you hadn't heard that there was actually going to be an invasion, did no. you? No. Okay. It was after the fact that you realized how right. fortunate you were. Right. So you went to radio school in Liverpool. Right. How long were you there for? See, I was there for about uh, a few days in May, all of June, and then early July, I was shipped across the English Channel to France. And did you understand the whole concept of being a radio operator? Yes. So you weren't with your unit? No, but a strange thing, we were part, we, we knew that we were going to be with the 30th Division. We didn't know what regiment or anything at the time, but it was the 30th Division. We already had the 30th Division patch on our arm, as you will see from the picture that I gave you, it shows you the patch. And there was an interesting history about that patch. It's an oval patch, and in it it has a letter O and then a letter H with a double bar going across for the H. And within that double bar are three X's, Roman numeral for 30. And I found out much later that this originated with Andrew Jackson. I don't know what year it was, and he was, his men were very fond of him, and they nicknamed him, as you know, Old Hickory. So within the 30th Division, there's an O and an H for, for Old, Old Hickory, Hickory, and the thir three X's for 30th Division. Perhaps we can show that picture. I don't know, Dan. Tell me if you can see it. You want to hold that up? No. This was when you were 18. 18 years old. And you can see right here yeah. the O and the, and H, the H with the three X's inside. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So you left Liverpool. Right. And how, how were you transported from there? From there, I really don't remember how I got to the... Uh, the pier in uh, England, most likely by train and truck, and then we were shipped across the, cha the channel to the Sherbrooke Peninsula, where Beachhead, of course, is ar had already been established. So this was this, after the invasion? This was after the invasion. The invasion was uh, June 7th, and we got there sometime in early July, middle of July. What did you find when you arrived? Well, everything seemed to be pretty well organized. We were transferred to a holding area near the town of St. Lo in the Sherbrooke Peninsula. Were the villagers around? Did you see them? Yeah, we went through villages. And were they friendly towards you? Oh, yes, they were very happy to see us there. Had you heard about the invasion and the fact that so many of yes. your servicemen had been killed? Yes. So what was that like for an 18-year-old going over there? Well, you know, you hear about it, but it doesn't really mean anything until you're there. You see these things happen in the movies, and it still doesn't mean anything because you're not involved. But once, only when you're involved do you really have a sensation or a real feeling of what it means to be in a situation like that. So you were almost the backup troops coming in after right. the we're, initial right. invasion. We were you? backup troops. We were replacement troops. And as a replacement troop, how soon... After your arrival at St. Lo, did you go into combat? Well, let's see. We were probably there for about a week, and one night, very late, we were going to be transported closer to the front by truck. 
And of course, we couldn't have lights on at the time, so it was pitch black, and we were again loading ourselves on the truck. And this happened to about three other soldiers. They couldn't see anything. We're reaching up. I reached up to pull myself up on the truck, and there was a jagged piece of metal, and I ripped open the palm of my hand. So I had to be left behind with two or three other guys that this happened to. Have it stitched up, and then we uh, had to stay there till it healed. And probably about uh, end of July, July, uh, August 1st or 2nd, we were then shipped to the front again. Uh, we were shipped to the front. And at that point, w where was the front? The front was in, uh, we were at that time, we were about 30 miles south west of Paris. And we were going through wooded areas and fields and uh, at that time, the Germans were trying to pull back, and we were just trying to precipitate that happening. I keep pushing them. And we were getting closer to Paris, probably in one of the suburbs outside of Paris, when I was shot across the shoulder and the back. Tell us about that day. What was that like for you? Well, we were in a narrow patch of wood jutting out into a field, something like a peninsula wood in water. I mean, this is woods jutting out into a field. And the Germans were by and going by us, and, and they weren't aware that we were there. And uh, once we had orders to start firing, we had uh, the bazookas were firing at the tanks, and we were firing at the soldiers. And then this battle went on for several hours. And then they finally moved, they kept moving out and we were pursuing them. And during one of these, about well, three or four days later, one of these battles, I got shot across the shoulder and back. And then I was hit with shrapnel in my, in my face, my nose, my ankle, and my wrist. And I didn't know what happened when I was shot across the shoulder. I just felt something. I looked back and I could see blood and my tattered jacket and clothes. And uh, they were saying that the uh, medics were probably about uh, 30 or 40 feet back and they couldn't get, come up any closer. And if anybody could crawl back to them, do that or wait till they came forward. But I was able to crawl and I went back and that's when the medics took over. Did you feel pain? No, I didn't feel any pain because it was numbing sensation. It felt as if somebody had swung at my back and shoulder with a sledgehammer and hit it so hard that it was just numbing. And in the hospital, when and it was a field hospital in France, when they patched it up, operated, what, did what they had to do, once the numbness and the uh, The, uh, what is it that they give you? The anesthesia, not the anesthesia, whatever they gave you, the, the number of the pain, once that started to wear off, then pain would set in. How long was it? Was, it, it wasn't that bad. I, I have a high tolerance for pain, and I didn't really have to take anything for it. Did you think at that time that my service is over, maybe they'll send me home, or did you? At that time, what they did, they flew me back to uh, Exeter to an army hospital in Exeter, England, which is in the southwestern corner of England. And while I was there, I celebrated my 19th birthday in that hospital. And I thought I would be sent home after uh, I healed. But instead, I was sent back to the front again. How did you feel about that? Well, it was necessary. I had no choice. And I had to do what had to be done, that's all. Now, when you were sent back, did you join up with your with same unit? The, the, the 30th, the same division, right. Mm -hmm. Joined up with them. And uh, we were in a high hill or mountainside overlooking Malmody. You've heard of Malmody in Belgium? Mm -hmm. 
Melmody was, when the Germans broke through, they really massacred that town. And on their way beyond that, there was a uh, U.S. Army artillery group that we heard about later. There were about 200 men, and at the time, the Germans weren't taking any prisoners. They rounded up these 200 men, brought them to an open field, and machine gunned them down. And about two or three of them pretended they were dead, and they survived, and they were the ones who told the story. Now, were they army, army. men? They weren't army villagers. They were... They Army were, artillery soldiers. Okay. So, so they were basically breaking what was known as the Geneva Conference, That's weren't right. They? In fact, like the Nuremberg trials, holding the, some of the Germans responsible for the war crime, there was a war crime also for this particular massacre. And you were close to that? We were very close to that. Then, one of the uh, most difficult parts then, this was already in December or in January, and we had to keep moving. And at night, the hardest thing was trying to dig a foxhole in the frozen ground. And even though our clothes were warm enough, you never had enough blankets. You wanted to line up the foxhole, and you couldn't dig it that deep because it was so frozen with blankets. But you said you did have proper clothing. Right, we did have proper clothing. And what about your sh boots? You know, I, I often wonder how they kept getting food coming to the front. We always had food. We always had our little packs of cheese or spam or whatever else was in the packages. Rations of food. Right, that's right. We always had something. What about your boots, though, the boots that you wore on your feet? Were they waterproof? They or? were waterproof. They were well insulated. Do you feel that when you were in the field hospital and then back in Exeter that you got appropriate medical? Oh yes, help? the medical care was excellent. I have no complaints about that at all. And do you feel that your officers your, that were leaders were good leaders? Yes, they were. Did you befriend? Did I what? Befriend a lot of your troop mates at all? A few. But uh, what happened afterwards, when I was wounded the second time, sort of made me become distant from everybody. Why? What happened? Well, when, when I was shot this time, I got shot through the mouth. So tell us and leading up to that. This is the second time you got wounded. Right. We were, again, it was a matter of pushing the enemy back out of the Belgium towards Germany. And there were many skirmishes and battles. A lot of them would give up, and they'd be taken prisoners and sent back. And occasionally, there'd be one group way over to the right that would be raising their hands coming out. And all of a sudden, if you turn, there'd be like a farmhouse there or a barn there. Some of the Germans were hidden there. They would start firing. They'd fall down, and they'd start firing. And we had to start all over again until you get everything under control. But that's, that's what our basic uh, job was at that time, was clearing them, getting rid of all the uh, areas that they were holed up in. When you captured the Germans, did you hand them over to MPs? To right, there was, there were, that's right. There were certain uh, military groups behind us that would take care of that. And then you had to keep plugging forward. Right, right. So you're in Belgium, and it's winter time. Winter time. And talk about the day that you got shot again. Well, it's a strange thing. The day I got shot, I try to think back, and when I was shot, it probably did something to my memory because there's only one thing I can remember for several weeks before that. I just remember that one incident I was telling you about when some of the Germans were come, giving up this side and others were firing this side and I was pointing over there and all of a sudden there was nothing. It was, it was as if I were dead. 
and uh, no feeling at the moment of impact. I didn't know what happened when I found out later. But at the moment of impact, I can't even draw the line between consciousness and unconsciousness. It was as if I didn't exist anymore. And you were shot in the face? I was shot through the mouth. Well, it went, and all the doctors are amazed because anybody that gets shot through the mouth never survives. But this must have went at an angle. It tried away teeth, gum, bone, and exited just below my right ear. So you're lucky you're alive. And how? But you I'm really, thankful for that fact that I'm here and able to talk about it. But you really don't remember it. No. I was told you know, afterwards what had happened. I don't know that I was shot how, what happened. And a very strange thing happened. I don't know how much longer it was after I was shot. I had two what I consider out-of-body experiences. I opened my eyes and I was standing up in the middle of the road looking down at myself. Somebody had propped me up against a snow bank. And I just saw myself. I didn't feel anything. Didn't. I was just aware that I was looking at myself there, and then nothing. Then again, I don't know what the time interval was. I was standing in the middle of the road again, looking down at myself. I was being carried on a stretcher. I was face down, and I looked. I can see a trail of blood on the snow below as they were moving the stretcher along, and then nothing. The third time I came to, it was me, myself, I opened my eyes and I knew immediately where I was. I recognized there were bright lights over me and there were masked doctors working on me. Now, I couldn't tell where they were working. I felt nothing. But somehow inside, I knew they were working on my face. And to this day, I'll never forget what I asked the doctors. This is what concerned me. Don't forget, I just turned 19 about four months before this happened. I looked up and I asked, Doctor, is this going to spoil my looks? And then I was gone. <laughs> That's what I was concerned about at that time. But they did a remarkable job. Then I thought afterwards to myself, while I was in the uh, uh, ward recuperating, I said, what did the doctors think about that? They must, must have thought first, this is sort of a foolish thing to ask. Here they are working to save my life, and I'm asking about my looks. Then I said to myself, on the other hand, they didn't know how badly I was injured, what my mind was like. In other words, they might have said, well, that's not bad. He's asking a question that makes a lot of sense. Especially for a 19-year-old. Right. Exactly. That's, what, that's how I analyze it. Yeah. I did a lot of that to myself when I was injured this, this So time. when you woke up and you're asking this question, where were you? When, when I woke up, I couldn't ask any questions. But they, I was flat on my back. And because my jaw was fractured, they had wired it shut. And the nurse and the doctor would come by. I could nod my head. And they would tell me what happened and what they had done. So this was fine. I, was, I must have been being fed intravenously because I, don't, I couldn't eat anything. And uh, I don't know how many days after, as the pain, as the numbness wore off of the injury and whatever the doctors, anesthesia the doctors had given me, the pain that set in was excruciating. This was really terrible. And I would mumble, yell, yell for help, and they came over and I got a shot of morphine. And immediately it takes effect. I felt as if I were floating on a pink cloud no sensation, no feeling of anything, just floating and happy. And I had to get a second shot weeks later. And that was the end of the, the morphine that I required. Now, were you still at a field hospital? Or I was were still you? in the field hospital. Mm -hmm. Then it must have been sometime in February, I think, they sent me to an army hospital in England. And I was still flat in my back. My jaw was still wired, but they were able to put a straw through the opening here because there was no gum, no teeth, 
and I would drink. I was able to drink liquids, and I don't know how long it was—weeks, two weeks. Uh, every day they would sponge bathe me down, and they would sh wash me, shave me, brush my hair. And meanwhile, the doctor was there, and I had this terrible, loud ringing in my ear. Your right ear. My Where right you ear. Were constant loud ringing, which I have to this day. It, it never leaves me. So I asked the doctor. He said, "Well." Probably because of the bullet going through your mouth, it created a vacuum in your ear, and there is nothing we can do about it. Okay. Now I'm lying in bed, and I'm starting to feel a little better. I'm starting to move around, but I notice if I move my head sharply to the left or the right, if I hear somebody, I'd have to grab the bed. I'd get terrible episodes of vertigo. The whole room would seem to spin. And I asked the doctors about that. They said, gradually, that will fade. So eventually, I'm feeling better. I want to sit up. I want to shave myself. So they brought over all the paraphernalia, the water, the basin, the razor, all, everything that goes with it. And they propped me up. And I looked up in the mirror, and I almost went into shock. I couldn't believe that was me in the mirror. The right side of my face was so swollen and discolored I didn't recognize myself, and my right eye was bulging, was swollen, and it was twitching. And this was the first time you had seen yourself? First time I saw myself after this injury. And you're all alone at 19, no 19. family around. Mm. And then also I noticed, this might have been done before, but I wasn't aware of it. I knew there was a sky here from the, uh, the shrapnel that me, but I noticed that my left nostril was enlarged, and all these things just jumped out at me. So you got upset. Do they have help for you emotionally to, to not, get through not, this? Not then they didn't. You know, it was a strange thing about me. I keep a lot of these things to myself. I would complain that, hey, I'm, I'm dizzy. What can, we, what can we do about that? The loud ringing, what can you do? Nothing. How are you feeling? Fine. And emotionally, I wasn't fine, but I just kept it to myself. Even as, as the years went by and I improved and I was able to cope with a lot of my problems, I still kept things to myself. It wasn't until about 2000, 2000 I never, could never discuss this with my friends or my family. And it wasn't until about 2000, 2001, when I was able to start talking about it. And that made me feel a lot better. What do you think made you start talking about it so late in life? Well, one of the things might be, you know, I kept all this in myself, and I would have terrible nightmares. And when I woke up in the morning, I didn't know what I dreamt, I didn't know what the nightmare was, but I know I had a nightmare. Now I'm married, and many times my wife would tell me, you had a nightmare last night. I said, how did you know? You were yelling in your sleep. Watch out, over there, watch out. Reliving maybe what you had gone through. Yeah, but I, I don't remember it in the morning. Mm -hmm. But my wife tells me she knew I had, I knew I had a nightmare in the morning. I cannot determine what it was, except that I did have a nightmare. But she knew because she said I was yelling in my sleep. Now I noticed this, since I started talking about it, I don't think I've had a nightmare since. You've gotten it out in the open. So you can kind of put it aside, although you never that, forget it. That might it. be it. So tell me, going back to you have all these issues and you're in a hospital in England. At this point, did you know you were definitely going home? Oh, after yes. That? Yes, I knew that I was going home. And what was happening at home? Did they receive word? How? They, of course, they received a telegram that your son was wounded in action. And the first time I was able to write, so I could write letters that I was wounded, but I'm fine and I'm recovering. This time I couldn't do anything. So they didn't really know. Right. They didn't know how bad it was. 
And how long were you in the hospital in England? Let's see, I was in England probably about five or six weeks. Then they flew me back to the States, to New York, and from New York they flew me to uh, Valley Forge General Hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. And it was an army hospital? An army hospital. And what, how was the care there? Basically the care was very good. The only complaint I have, even about the, the care there, was that the psychiatrist there, and even the psychiatrist at the VA that I've been going to since I've been out of service, looking back now, I feel they had so much more information at their fingertips than their counterparts have dealing with the general public because they have access to the Army records. They know about the injuries. They know about the vertigo. They know about the loud ringing. They know about the bilateral deafness. They know about your visual uh, impairness. And all they ask is, how are we feeling today? Instead of saying, tell me, Milton, how does your loud ringing in your ear affect you at school, affect you at home, affect you with your wife or with your or how does the vertigo, how does your appearance, how do you feel about the way you look? How does that affect you when you meet people? They don't ask anything like that. They go, how are you feeling? How are we feeling today? How long? Now that I look back, I can see what, the, you know, what uh, they could have and should have done. Which would have been more helpful immediately. Right. At the time, I wasn't aware of it. I should have said something, but I didn't. I always kept to myself, even my friends and my family tells me now that was one of my big faults. They never hear me complain. And you had a lot to complain about. How long were you at Valley Forge Hospital? About eight months. And did you have visitors there? Uh, yes. In fact, I'll never forget this. When my uh, mother and father came down to visit me, I was outside. A lot of us would be waiting outside on a nice day and waiting for visitors. And as they approached, I said, hi. They walked right by. I said, it's me, you're Milton. They didn't recognize you right away. Mm -hmm. Had you lost a lot of weight also? No, I, you know, I almost weigh about this now about the same I did when I was in service. Maybe I was a few pounds less in service. After I got married, I gained weight. And then with part of my, one of my surgeries I had afterwards, I just lost the extra weight and I've been keeping this weight for years now. So when your parents, the initial shock of realizing that it was you, how, mm. what was, what was memorable about the visit that you remember with your parents? Just the fact that they didn't recognize mm. me to start with. And that had to be pretty stunning for them mm, to, to also recognize the fact mm -hmm. that things had changed a bit. So you were there for eight months, and were they starting discharge papers for you at that time? Well, what they, see, what they did well, they had to take care of the damage in my mouth. They couldn't put in teeth or anything yet. They just had to do some restoration in my mouth, just basic. And uh, what else? I'm trying to think. My eyesight, there's nothing they can do with the eyesight. My so when you right, talk about your eyesight, is it the same side as? Yeah, my right side, a hole was created in the retina behind the eye as a result of the bullet smashing through. And there was nothing they could do about that. So have you completely lost eyesight in that eye? Well, right now I am considered both by the VA and by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I'm legally blind. I can see you sitting there, but I can't make out your features. 
I'm 20 pounds thinner than you really think. What's that? <laughs> I'm 20 pounds thinner than you really <laughs> think. Uh, um, so that had to be really difficult for you too, having to deal with reconstruction, the fact that your eyesight right. was uh, changed. Well, at that time, I had good vision in my left eye, and I was able to read, I was able to go to school, I was able to drive a car, and gradually, my eyesight, both eyes just faded. And I should have given up driving 10 years before I did, because I knew I was a menace in the road, but it's something that it's hard to do, but I finally did. So getting back to after Valley Forge, were you discharged? Were you still in the service? Did you come back to Massachusetts? No, I was discharged, and it was October 18, 1945, from Valley Forge. And I was still in a terrible condition. I had to go to the uh, VA dentist in Boston. At that time, it was on Court Street. And what they had there, were a lot of the old time doctors who had retired from private practice, but now it was an opportunity for them to continue with their practice without having the headaches of running a business at the same time. And this particular doctor started to continue the restoration of my mouth, and finally after a couple of months he said, you know, to save you a lot of trouble and save us a lot of trouble, I recommend that we extract all your teeth, which left me absolutely cold. From that point on, I started to go to my own private dentist for many years. And to, my dentist finished restoring my mouth. He did an excellent job in putting in an upper partial for this side where teeth were missing. And I continued going with him until he passed away at a very young age. And when he did pass away, I found out that there was a new breed of young dentists at the VA who felt he'd do anything to save a tooth rather than extract it. So I've been going back to the dental clinics at the VA now, and I'm very pleased with them. They've been doing a wonderful job for me. Well, they must have felt that it was quite a unique situation trying to reconstruct your mouth, correct? Right. Back then, especially where they didn't have implants like they do today or mm -hmm. things of that nature. So that whole time, you didn't have teeth? I didn't have, just, I was missing, I had teeth on this side and this side and on the lower. Nothing from here all the way around the top. I have what they call one half of a masticatory surface. And even with the teeth in my mouth, I can chew only on my left side because I can't use the right side for chewing. And even, that, even today, because there's gum and bone missing here, they couldn't do implants on that side. And even though the VA does not do implants now, I had to have two imp implants done on the lower left side, and they authorized me to have it by dentist of my choice on the outside, since they didn't do it at the time. Now, along with the issue with the gum and the jaw, did you have ner nerve damage in your mouth also? No, I don't think there was nerve damage. So you have taste? Have what? Taste? taste? Yes. That's good. Yeah. Have taste. And here's a strange thing. When I got out of service, they had, I got a list of all the things that were wrong, and they gave me a 10% disability compensation. A year later, I was called up to the VA for an examination, and the doctor that examined me, he was also a uh, rating specialist doctor. He looked at, he told me, Milton, I looked at your records, and I look at you, and he said, hell, he said, you should have been getting 50% from the day you got out, and he made it retroactive from that time. But even then, a lot of things were overlooked that I wasn't aware I could have been entitled to. But things got all ironed out in the end, and I got a list of all the disabilities. And it amazes me that 
I'm able to, that I'm here, I was able to cope with it all. So you got a medical discharge? Yes. What rank were you when you were? Private. And how many Purple Hearts did you have? I have a Purple Heart with an oak leaf. Now what do they call it, a Purple Heart with a, sometimes I forget how they word it. Purple, no that's not it. Purple Heart, yeah, with oak leaf cluster and three bronze battle stars. You know, when I gave up driving, I thought I would miss it more than anything else. But what I miss the most is not being able to pick up a letter or a book. To read. And able to read, even with the book with large print. Mm. Can't read it. So I do the next best thing. I get these uh, talking books through the Perkins Library for the Blind, and they've been wonderful. And I enjoy that. So you're 19 years old. You've gotten a medical discharge, and you go home to Boston. Well, I don't know what they call it medical discharge. What they call it, let's see. Was, you can read it better than I can. Honorably discharged. You got an honorable discharge. discharge. Okay. And, Not medical, and so, yeah, honorable. but medically, you. I required a lot of care from that point on. And so you go home to your parents. Right. And tell us about that next year, what, what transpired. What was it like for you getting back into. It was kind of difficult. And what was most difficult for me, I went back to BU. And it was very difficult for me to make, new fr to make friends because I was very self-conscious about my appearance. With my old friends, it was another thing. I, I didn't care. They knew me. And I was able to handle them very well. But I couldn't make new friends. So I was sort of a loner when I went to college. I went four years to BU. And I might have had one or two not close friends, but friends, but I don't see them anymore. And you got a degree, a business degree? I got, no, I got a uh, degree in education, but I, I, I went into business on my uh, working career. Now, did you know your wife at this point in time? No. When did you meet her? I met my wife. She, I, I graduated school in 49, so I met my wife in 1948. I was spending a summer at the beach with my aunt, and my wife had rented a cottage someplace in uh, Hull with three of her friends. And next door to my aunt was a gal who knew my wife to be, and she said, Milton, I want you to have somebody I want you to meet. And that's how I met her. And when I met her, I felt very comfortable with her. She, you know, a lot of people I, f I feel, now I don't, but at the time, but when they're looking at me, they notice that my nostrils enlarged, they notice my face is distorted. She never gave me that impression. So it was meant to be. Mm hmm And a strange story about that, too. The year before I met her, I was friendly with this a uh, woman who married across the street, and she was moving from Roxbury to Mattapan, and she asked me if I'd drive her there. She wanted to get the keys from the woman who was moving out so she can get her painter in. So I drove her there, but the woman wasn't there. She said she must be at her house in Newton. We drove to Newton, and she said, Milton, come on in, because uh, her sister is uh, staying with her while she's moving in. You want to meet her? I said, no, I don't feel like meeting anybody at the time. That was my wife a year before. Really? So you weren't quite ready. Right. And that's probably, again, the mm -hmm. way it was meant to be. Right. So you had said earlier that one of the issues was you couldn't discuss it. So when you came home, did any of your friends ask you about what happened? Or well, one of them asked me, first of all, what does it feel like to be shot? So I explained that sledgehammer and so forth and so on. 
And another one asked me a question that I thought was kind of a foolish question. How do you get shot through the mouth? So after a few moments, I says, I'll tell you what. I said, the Germans were such poor shots, I went, missed, missed, and finally somebody got a bullseye. <laughs> so you had a sense of humor. Right. But you didn't talk about it a lot, you said. What's that? You didn't talk no. about it a lot. No, they, they would ask questions, but I wouldn't uh, bring it up on my own. I would try to cut whatever they ask, cut it short. Do you feel at all that some of what you've experienced, like others, and later on in life you can look back and say perhaps it was post-traumatic stress that perhaps brought you down at times or not? No, I don't know. I don't know. You know why? Because when I came back to Valley Ford General Hospital from England, I felt very badly for myself. I felt sorry for myself. But while I moved around this hospital, going to my different appointments, I'd see other soldiers there. They have the same problem I have. Some of them would have a metal piece in their head. Some of them would be with the metal piece in a wheelchair, missing an arm, a leg, two arms, or two legs. And here I am, feeling sorry for myself when I see this problem. That helped me a lot. Everything becomes relevant. So actually being in the hospital helped you overcome that feeling of, you know, poor me. Because you that, saw... Because of, because of what I saw. Mm -hmm. Did you join any unit of... Uh, military reserve after? No. How about any veterans organizations? Right. Uh, well, I belong to the Disabled American Veterans Group, and I belong uh, to the uh, Jewish American Veterans Group. Have you ever spoken at organizations or in the classroom about any of your experiences? No, I never have. And you have received veterans benefits, hospitalization, yes. GI been, Bill also? And what? The GI Bill for being Yes, I, had, I went to college, the GI Bill. And over the years, now since the, after the first fiasco with the dentist there, they take very good care of me, dental audio. I now require special hearing aids. This is a new one I got about a month or so ago. It's a digital, and the only way you can have a digital hearing aid is if you have wires attached. The ones before this were wireless, so they couldn't be digital. You have to have this wire crossing from one to the other. And I find that they're a big help. I noticed in our conversation, I don't have to ask you to repeat too many times, yeah. because I hear pretty good with this now. It's more acute hearing. Right. right. So they, they take care of that, and I get all my medication through the VA. And since I am a WASH service connected, 100% disabled vet, my wife is able to get medication through a different branch of the VA now. This is something comparatively new that they notified me about. Also, because of my, I always wanted to get a computer. But I could never read, even when my eyes were better, good enough to drive, I could never read the print on the computer. So now I, was, I found out that I, I, was a, I was able to get a computer through the VA with a printer, and they have a special program called ZoomText. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. Yes, I am. And uh, it enables me to make the print as large as I require to see it on the screen. And at the same time, it has a voice talking to me. And they got me private lessons. And I have a printer that goes with that. And in low vision care, they give me all kinds of paraphernalia. This is wonderful because when I go to a restaurant, I can never read the menu to use this. So it's light and... And a magnifier. a magnifier. And when I go to a store 
if I want to pick out something for myself, I can't see the prices. If it's a shirt or looking for something, I have to use that. So things have gotten better. Things have gotten years. much better. I've accepted a lot of my problems. And uh, also, be because of the uh, of my injury, back in 1976, I had to have surgery. I had to have a total colectomy. So I wear a colostomy appliance. And that was a very difficult thing to adjust to, but I did. And uh, life goes on. I try to keep busy. Even though my eyesight is bad, I enjoy playing bridge and I use large cards. Even though I still get diamonds mixed up with hats and the club with the spades, but I try to keep busy. Now, was the colectomy directly related to your service injuries also? Yes, that's related. To, uh, I, I told you, you know, when I kept all this in me, I developed a very nervous condition because of that. Mm -hmm. And I developed ulcerative colitis that was service related. And that eventually led to this colectomy. Do you attend any reunions of your old outfit? No. Have you ever? No. You know, I was in basic training. I was friendly with three other men. We were kind of close. We'd go, we'd get weekend passes, we'd go away together. And uh, then something happened one day. You know, it's funny. We're, we're all in service, not because of our religious background, not because of where our parents came from, or not be, only because of where we're all Americans. And I was friendly with these guys. One of them, he was married. He was about 23, 24 years old. And uh, we all got along. There were four of us. And one day, he and I were having a discussion, just two of us. And I didn't agree. I don't even remember what the discussion was about. But I disagreed with what he was saying. He tried to convince me. I wouldn't budge. And he came up with, you Jews are all alike. So I was stunned at first, and I said, what, do you, what is that supposed to mean? What does it mean by that? And he was kind of flustered for saying it. He says, forget I said it. And he said, let's drop it, which I did. But it was still in the back of my mind. But after service, I did get out. He, he lived in South Boston, and I called him. But we never got together. Did you run into that? discrimination a the, lot during that your was the, service? That was the, that was the first only and only time. Did you keep in touch with any of the others? No. How important to you was serving in the military? What's that? How important to you was serving in the military? I think it was a very important part of my life because it was, it was at a crucial time it was what, even though wars shouldn't be considered popular, this was considered a popular war. That is, everybody felt that it was the right thing to do at the time. And I, I was a part of it. And where before I was always kind of embarrassed of the way I looked. And the bathing suit, the scars on my back. But I feel now it's almost like a, uh, a badge. A medal of honor. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel, or do you feel, in any ways that it affected your life going forward? Mm, I would say, I don't think so. I don't think it did. It may be hindered a little, only because when I would sit and go to a classroom, I would always try to sit on the right-hand side of the classroom facing the professor so he would see what I considered my good side. Also, this was my good ear. I could hear better. At the time, I didn't have hearing aids, and I still had that loud ringing in my ear, which prevented hearing on that side. So it was sort of a hindrance, but uh, they always did that. In fact, one day what happened, this was at BU before they had built their campus completely at, uh, on Commonwealth Avenue. They had some classes conducted in a school building at Copley Square. 
don't know whether you were aware of that or not at the time. But uh, outside the building one Friday, there was an automobile accident. And Monday, I came to class. I got it a little late, so I had to sit on the left side. This side was facing the professor. So on the way out, he stopped me. He says, was I involved in that accident outside the classroom on Friday? Because I think he saw the side for the first time. And he noticed there was a difference. Did you have to explain to him what it happened? No, I didn't. I said, no, I wasn't. I wouldn't say anything about it. When you finished college, what, what was your business career after? When I finished college, I wanted to use French or Spanish that I majored in. So I worked for a uh, firm in downtown Boston called P.C. Fernandez. It was an exporting firm uh, selling shoe machinery, shoe finding, shoe leathers to uh, countries in Latin America. And also at the same time, it was owned by Mr. Philip, Felipe Fernandez. He was the, his office was also the consulate of Guatemala in Boston at that time. Today in Boston there is no consulate of Guatemala here, it's in New York. But we worked there. Then he eventually he wanted to move his office to New York and I didn't want to move. We left an office here and I became the secretary of the consulate of Guatemala in Boston, taking care of official Guatemalan documents and things, people going back and forth or shipping to Guatemala. And you spoke fluent Spanish. Spanish. And how long did you do that? Did that for about uh, three or four years and he wanted to close the office in Boston. And then after that, what did you do? I worked for a uh, plastic houseware manufacturer, developing an export market for him, for the company in South America and in the islands. I traveled through, at that time, I traveled through Bogota, Medellin, Cali, Colombia, Quito, Guayaquil, Ecuador, Caracas, Venezuela, and Panama. And then one year I went to uh, Germany. A plastic manufacturer has to change designs of their products every periodically. So the old molds you can't use anymore. So he was trying to sell these molds to firms in Europe, which is what I went to Europe for then. So you used your Second language, quite Second a bit, language didn't you? And, and sort of business skills. Mm -hmm. Looking back, what was either the most memorable experience, character, or incident that comes to mind? Well, it would be that incident that I mentioned before of having that weird out of body experience looking down at myself. Some people say they see a light. Did you see light? No, I didn't see. No, it's a funny thing you mentioned that. One of my friends several years ago lost her husband. And she believes, and there's no, nobody any harm, that she, through a medium she was able to contact him. And he told her about a light that he had to go through. So I told her one day, Gladdy, you know, I was out and I didn't see any light. She says, that's because you weren't ready. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's probably correct. Above all, is there one thought or comment or something additionally that you would like to mention either to your family who will be seeing this tape or to others who might borrow it from the library? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think as I look back and I see all the physical and mental problems that I went through, I find out that slowly but surely there were solutions for each one of them. Even though I kept it into myself, I managed to handle it one way or another. And I, I feel that no matter what your problems may be, there's always a way to resolve it. If not by, the, by step A, but go to step B or step C, there's always a solution to a problem without letting it get you down. 
And obviously from talking to you, your first solution was to keep it in. I kept and it in. And then later on, when you were ready. I talked, about, I talked about incidents, but I never talked about what was happening to me, yeah. about my pain or about the discomfort. I never talked about myself uh, being wounded or what I suffered. But I talk about how to handle, how I handle these problems. Well, you have done an exceptional job. Milton D. Cohen, we want to thank you for coming in and sharing your story with us today. It's important to be heard. And thank you. I appreciate you having me here. Thank Believe you. me. Thank you.